Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchmen video broadcast. You ever see the movie The Matrix? I have. The whole series of The Matrix movies, uh, the Wachowski brothers, they ransacked all of Earth's religions. They can just kind of compiled it down into one. And then they took every cool science fiction idea that there was and packed it down into this movie. I, I say science fiction. Because science fiction, and I've, I have read science fiction, I've enjoyed science fiction all my life. I'm like a sci-fi guy, a geek, a sci-fi geek, used to be, more so now. I just like to deal with the reality of the Bible. But I know a little bit about what's been written, what's been put in movies over time. And it's always interesting that the things that showed up, let's say, in a book or in a movie or a cartoon 50, 100 years ago, 25 years ago, it always has a way of ending up like in somebody's hand. The tricorders they used on Star Trek. We're getting close to that now with the handheld devices. And all of the things that are going on right now ha- ha- had a start in the, in the imagination realm of the mind. They, they just sort of people dreamed it up to see if it could become reality. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. The other day I was uh, at the hospital uh, with my daughter who was giving birth to our grandbaby and I was just kind of going over some news articles, some things that were going on in the science realm and I saw this when I could not believe my eyes. Two articles actually linked together we're going to deal with this week. Uh, here's the first one. I want you to listen to this now. Now remember, this is not science fiction that I'm going to be reading you. It is now science fiction. It used to be science fiction because in the Matrix movie, you had the character Neo and you had all these people. And Neo finds out that he's like in a la-la land, a dream world, a, a, a world created by the, com- a virtual world created by the computers. That's already taking place now too. Uh, but anyway, uh, you, you see Neo and uh, he gets what they call jacked in. This big, big old long probe that sticks up in the back of his head. And all of a sudden he's in this little world and they download a program to his brain. And now he knows karate, he knows jujitsu, he knows, he knows different languages, he knows all of these things and he learns how to manipulate them with the power of his mind. And all this is done scientifically. Listen to this article here. An MRI machine could teach you Kung Fu and everything else. The idea of jacking yourself into some sort of machine that can teach you anything you want to know without you having to, you know, do anything is total science fiction. Or it would be if some researchers hadn't just done it. Teachers, you are now obsolete. Just a few months ago, we wrote about how UC Berkeley researchers have been able to use functional MRI machines to extract your genes from inside your brain. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. A joint American and Japanese team has since discovered that this technique works both ways. It's possible to use an MRI machine to generate specific patterns inside your brain that can be used to teach you new things. Now, the article is going to tell you how it works. You pick a task that requires high performance from your visual cortex, like catching a ball. Then you go find someone who's a pro at catching a ball, stick them in an MRI machine, and record what's going on in their brain while they visualize catching a ball. Now you've got your ball-catching program, and you're ready to learn. Next step, put yourself into the MRI machine and rig it to induce that pro ball-catching imagery that you recorded earlier in your brain using neurofeedback. You don't even have to be paying attention while this is going on. Your brain, though, becomes familiar with that pattern, which is what learning is. Your brain becoming familiar with patterns. Play that pattern back enough, and you'll get better at whatever activity the pattern is associated with. This isn't just conjecture. The researchers involved have shown that this MRI pattern playback can, in fact, quote, cause long-lasting improvement in tasks that require visual performance. In theory, a type of automated learning is a potential outcome. Yes, that's right. Automated learning, it's real science. Now, who besides me thinks this is just spooky? 
Okay. Uh, now let me go back. If I was a, if I was like in high school again, or I was going to college again, I would dig this. I would so get into this because I hated to study. I hated to study books. I hated, and now I do that all the time. But I hated to do that, and I just wish that somehow, some way, they could just like inject all of this learning into my brain. That was back in the eighties when computers were first coming out. Now we're we're there. We have the ability as a species to take instantaneous ideas and put them directly into our brain and so that they're known immediately, including how to throw a ball, how to, how to do certain things. These ideas, where do they come from? You see, I have this little theory. I think that I think God's people are inspired by the Bible. We get our ideas, our philosophies, our ways of life. We get them from the scriptures and the Holy Ghost puts them into our heart. I want you to think about the opposite now. I want you to think about uh, what Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6. Because this is what I thought of when I'm going over this thing. Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. Four things here. Now, the thing I want to concentrate on today with this idea is powers. Powers. Think of powers. Think of spirits who inspire or give powers or ability to people that they do not ordinarily or have or cannot naturally acquire. I think that that's indicated in the scriptures. You remember the one who was possessed of devils? His name was Legion. The Bible tells us that he had super strength, that they would bind him with chains and he would just break the chains and then just go back to the grave, which is where he liked to to hang around dead people. Once you think about that for a while. Uh, But anyway, he had powers given to him by devil spirits. These are the things that you and I as born again Christians are wrestling against. Not the people who invent the machines, but the devils who inspire them. They are the ones who have powers, who want to give people powers. They want to, and I want you to think about this idea of implanting thoughts or seeding thoughts inside of someone's mind. That's, that's been done before. We're going to see the spiritual implications of it. While we're dealing with uh, Ephesians chapter 6, dealing with principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, we go back with this same concept back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel says he saw four great beasts rise up out of the sea. The fourth beast was dreadful and terrible. And when you read that description of that fourth beast, you'll see that this beast definitely has power over everyone. Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. We don't know exactly what that all entails, but we know that somehow, some way, there's going to be a fusion of this satanic realm into the very being and bodies of human beings, literally his seed, his DNA. And I think we're approaching that with the technology, with the ability. I talked about, uh, on one of these Watchmen broadcasts here not too long ago, about the idea, it's called the singularity. The idea at the time at which computers become so fast and so smart, and then we all together figure out a way of fusing this into our bodies and making making uh, the machine world part of our... This is like what the Terminator series is all about, what uh, uh, the Matrix is all about. I've seen all these movies about how the robots and the computers get smart. It never works out good for the humans, okay? Just telling you, it just never works out good for the humans because they control and dominate. That's what these principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, that's what these are all about. Daniel 7, the fourth beast, he rules over all mankind. Daniel chapter 2, this is the fourth kingdom on the earth that is dominating uh, planet earth. Then in Revelation chapter 6, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first one that comes out is a white horse and the rider on him has a bow and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. And so it's all about taking dominion over mankind. And the the whole focus of this is the human brain. It's the mind. I'd mentioned earlier about about this this idea of seeding thoughts. This uh, uh, this they mentioned the movie The Matrix. I remember uh, seeing a movie all the way back in the eighties. It was called Brainstorm with Christopher Walken. I mean, what I'm talking about it was weird. Okay, now the technology that they envisioned then. 
Uh, it was interesting because even in the movie, as they when they first developed this technology, the technology was to say hook this guy up to this massive helmet with all these wires and steam coming out of it and everything like that, and uh, it, it was reading his thoughts as he did something as he spoke. Um, the machine read his thoughts, it recorded his eyesight, recorded what he heard, it recorded how he moved his muscles, and it recorded everything that he felt. And it recorded on this big old massive uh, like videotape machine thing. And then they would put the helmet on somebody else and they would play that back and that person would experience exactly what this other guy did. That's what this machine, this MRI machine, this is the system that, that, that they designed right now. This was fantasized about in uh, Brainstorm back in, I think it was sometime in the mid-80s. And by the way, there was one, and I want you to think about all the, all, all the good possibilities of this, including all the bad ones. Part of this movie, Brainstorm, uh, and, and here's the, I was going to say this about the technology. As the movie progressed, they found ways of making the technology smaller and smaller. So it was just this little headset that this guy wore, Okay. That's exactly how things work nowadays. But in this movie, Brainstorm, uh, there was the element of the military takeover of this technology. Surely, surely the military would, would have no use whatsoever of uh, being able to plant special abilities inside of a person's brain. Surely they would have no interest in that whatsoever. Surely the CIA is not interested in psychological operations of any kind. Being able to plant thoughts and images and things inside of people's... Surely they don't want to do anything like that, do they? Yeah, I, I think they do. And then there's the fantasy aspect of it. In the movie, The Brainstorm, I just I saw the movie. I, I know what happened in this particular movie was a guy recorded him and another woman, okay? And then he just kept looping that playback over and over and over and over and over. It's like the ultimate of fantasy reality in people's lives. And we have the technology now. We have the capability. And all of this goes back. The ability to seed a thought in someone's brain. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You see, there's some people out there, and, and, and I kind of get where they, where they might be coming from on this. Um, the Bible talks about the first son of Adam and Eve, who was Cain. The Bible refers to Cain being of that wicked one. Now, some have taken this idea and said, ah, see, there was this, uh, the devil, he slept with Eve, and uh, Cain was like the son of the devil and Eve, and, and on and on and on. And, and I can, I don't agree with that, but I can kind of see where they get that. But here's what we, what we don't know is whether or not the devil actually mated with Eve. What we do know, what we know beyond any shadow of a doubt, what the, exactly what the devil did to Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. He spoke to her. And he spoke to her words that Adam had not said to her, that God had not said to her. He spoke to her words. You see, he's the, he's the tempter. He's the deceiver. He's all of these things. And he spoke words to her. And he planted a seed of thought inside of her brain, inside of her mind, which caused her to act precisely the way the serpent wanted her to act. In Genesis chapter 3, you see the serpent wanted her to eat the fruit. And so he spoke words to her that caused her to eat the fruit. Revelation chapter 13, we know for a fact a false prophet arises. And we know for a fact that he doesn't force anyone. The devil did not take Eve and grab her and shove this thing in her mouth. Say, eat this. That's not what he did. He just spoke. And he said the right things to her, the magic words, as it were. The false prophet does not force anyone to receive a mark on the right hand or forehead. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. And this all has to do with 
planting a, a thought or an idea into the imagination part of somebody's brain. Why the imagination part of somebody's brain? Because we have two sides of our brain. We have the left brain, which is the logical, critical thinking. Uh, sort of, we, we talked about this in our video, the, uh, the, the secret or the mystery of contemplative prayer. Uh, this idea that on the left side of the brain, it, it kind of looks like all these guys in white shirts and ties that work for IBM. They, they are there in cubicles and they're sorting through files and facts and information and going through, you know, you know, file folders looking for the right information, memories that are recorded. And that's the strong side of our brain. That's the one that's working the best and most everybody. And then we have the other side of the brain, which is the right side, which is the creative part. It sings songs and writes poems and draws pictures and invents it invents things okay and then it hands the invention the creativity the idea over to the engineers and the brain and says how can we make this thing work see how it works science fiction people are the dreamers they dream this stuff up or or they get inspired to do this stuff through the creative part of their brain. They dream this stuff up, hand it over to the tech guys over on the other side and say, here, figure out how to work this thing. Okay? And that's, that's exactly what happened. That's the, like the core of technology here. So I want you to think about this idea of imaginations. The Apostle Paul told us to cast down imaginations. Why? It's not that, you know, we're never to use this side of our brain. That's not true because this is part of our humanity. It is part of our mind. It is part of how God designed us, and they both work well together. But I want you to notice that in the Garden of Eden, the devil did not go to Adam. Adam, who is represented by this side of the brain, who, uh, you know, thinks logically and critically and things like that, he went to the weaker vessel, Eve. And she imagined all of this in her mind. And she thought about it. She created a scenario by which this would be good for her. And she went and did it. And you have to understand that's exactly how temptation works. It goes into our creative side of our brain. And we, we sort of imagine what this sin would be like if we were doing it. We draw a picture of it. Now, the logical part of our brain is saying, oh, there's consequences here. The lawyers are over here saying, I'm, I'm sorry, according to subsection four, you can't do this. And the creative side of the brain says, oh, but it would be wonderful. You see how that works? Okay, so think about imaginations. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, and see how God views this idea of man's imagination or man's creativity kind of taking over the world. Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now, let's stop and think about this for a minute, see how this works in the technology world that we live in. Computers, in case you don't know this, I don't care if it's an IBM computer or a Packard, Hewlett Packard computer or a Dell computer or an Apple computer or a iPad or an Android phone or whatever, doesn't matter. Computers everywhere in the world, I don't care if it's like the big computer that IBM has. Did you know they all speak one language? Okay. It's called, the, now there are different programming languages for humans to interface with these machines, but the primary language that all computers everywhere speak in the entire world is binary. It's a system of switches. It goes back to the old days when the people in lab coats and clipboards were flipping switches on these massive computers to add 2 plus 2 to make it equal 4. That's how they figured out how to, how to compute things. And so computers all speak the same language. Every one of them, they all have one language. And remember, we're, we're working toward a day when computers and technology is going to be part of our physical being. And so think about Genesis chapter 11. And God said, I, I got to put a stop to this because they all speak one language and they're all one. And now nothing is going to be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Now, now what did God do? to bust all this up. He confused their languages. We're going to see something about that here in a little bit too to try to bring everybody back together so we can finish what was started in Genesis chapter 11. But God said they first dream it up or it's inspired to them. A thought is seeded into their brain. Then they figure out how to do it and nothing will be restrained for them. And God says, 
They can't handle this kind of information. It always turns bad for the human being. Is, is that true? Yes. When, when uh, the serpent gave his words to Eve and seeded that thought inside of her mind, it changed her. It did something to her. It messed her brain up, messed her thoughts up. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate what? To look at that word, mind. To do those things which are not convenient. Let me tell you what was convenient. It was convenient for Adam to wake up every morning, walk over to a banana tree and pull a banana off and eat it. That was convenient. I mean, that's pretty, pretty convenient. God was going to feed Adam and Eve inside the Garden of Eden conveniently. But now that they've sinned, God puts them out of the garden and says, Adam, go to work. You're going to have to work by the sweat of your face, you're going to put food in your mouth. It's not going to be convenient for you anymore. It's not going to be easily attained. And when God gives people over to a reprobate mind, that's what happens. Things start getting difficult and things start getting hard. Romans chapter 8 verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. But I fear lest by any means. Here it is. Look at here. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The Apostle Paul is warning us who live in this day. See, some people like to say, well, you know, the Bible was written, you know, 2,000 years ago for these people. It meant a lot to them. It doesn't really mean a lot to us now. I'm telling you, I think it means more now than it did back then. We can certainly see the corruption of the human mind taking place. And I want you to think about this. Remember the military guys. Remember, remember the Hollywood people, okay, and the porn people getting a hold of technology that can inject these ideas directly into the cortex of your mind. Is let's let's see, is that going to turn out good or is that going to turn out bad? It's going to turn out bad. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, through the simple implantation of a thought or an idea directly into the core of your brain, minds are corrupted. You see, when we read the Bible, our minds are renewed. The renewing of our minds, Paul talked about. But when we let the devil seed thoughts into us, our minds are corrupted. Um, there's a way, if you're a Christian, to avoid this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I, I just kind of have an idea. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's all going to pan out. But I have this idea that there's going to come a time when there's going to be the ability by, let's say, the New World Order, the principalities, the powers, rules, of, in other words, to, to give everybody this seed thought inside of their mind. And it's not going to work with Christians because Christ, who gives us peace that passes all understanding, keeps our minds and our hearts pure. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. First, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, no, just look at the language of minds and thoughts being corrupt. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You see, as men's minds become more corrupt, they don't gravitate toward the scriptures. They think that this, the Bible, the scriptures is just a joke. It's a bunch of myth. It's a fairy tale. It's not part of our news. That's what's going on in the church right now. The corruption of men's minds is taking place inside of the church. And so they, they, they don't like the faith. They don't like the truth. They're reprobate. You know what that word reprobate means? It means they're not able to be probated. They're not able to be corrected, reformed. They've kind of crossed a line and they're not coming back. Reprobate concerning the faith. Titus chapter 1 verse 15. Under the pure, all things are pure. That's why I believe the Bible is pure, the pure word of God. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even, look at this, their mind and conscience 
is defiled. Their mind and their conscience is defiled. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Think of a time now. Th- this technology here, it's, it's part of me, the flesh nature of me says, man, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. The Christian side of me says, this is not going to turn out well for mankind. The ability to plant these seeds right inside the brain of man to corrupt men and to defile their conscience. Let me, let me kind of explain what that means. The word conscience. I like breaking down words. The word con means with. Uh, chili con carne means chili with meat. So it's with. Con means with. Science means knowledge. Okay? So the word conscience means with knowledge. Your conscience is the part of your brain that remembers what you did. Okay, it remembers what you did. And um, when someone asked you, did you do this? Your conscience, the guys in the cubicles have opened up the file folder and they're going, yeah, yeah, we remember this. It's right here. Okay, that's your conscience. Your conscience knows that you did it. Okay, Um, and if you're going to lie about it, you can't ask the guys in the cubicles on the left side of the brain to, hey, read this out loud now. You can't do that. You have to have this over here, draw a picture of something else that you might have done instead of doing this. So in order to really lie, okay, and and here's what happens. When we do this, when we lie, our body gives out little signals. That's what a lie detector test detects. Little heartbeats and sweat and breathing. Sometimes we're, we're kind of understanding now that the, the way the eyes move. Uh, just little tells about people who play poker. They, they can read their people. People, mentalists can read people. They're not reading people's mind. They're reading their facial gestures and their hand gestures. They can kind of tell when someone is not being truthful. Detectives know how to pick up on this. They just can't use it in court very well. They have to prove it, but they can kind of pick these things up. You see, because we have a conscience, and in order to lie, our body sends out all these little red flags and flares everywhere because the guys in the cubicles are reading the papers and they're going, "Uh, no, that's not, uh, no, that, no, that didn't happen. And this part of the brain over here is going, shut up, shut, shut up. So you know what happens when the conscience is defiled? Okay. They take all the guys in cubicles, all the lawyers, all the technicians, all the everybody else, and they fire them. Okay, turn the lights out, lock up the folders. Nobody's going to read that information. Their conscience is defiled. There are some people who can lie in sin and think nothing of it. Think nothing. By the way, the Ten Commandments are written over here on pieces of paper, and the guys are going, "Oh no! According to this, we're not supposed to do this." So that's why we send all these guys home, lay them off, give them their last paycheck, turn the lights out, lock the folders up. Now their conscience defiled. Now the person can do whatever they dream up. And there's nobody telling them that they can't do it. And it's okay. This is the world we're headed into. Now, we have the technology now to do it on a massive scale. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Listen, listen to what God said. I love this. If you just want to think about what this technology can do, think about what God is already doing. Think about it. God said, I will put my laws into their mind. Did you catch that? And write them in their hearts, and I will be unto them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Look at this. God said, here are the guys in the cubicles with the folders and the paperwork and everything like that. God said, they already have all the laws here. God said, I'll put them into their mind. Put them into their heart. So that the body, the person, will do the right thing and do what's right. God said, I'm not just going to put them on a wall somewhere. I'm going to put them right into their mind. So think about it. Think about the opposite of this. Devil comes up, helps these guys in lab coats with the technology, and now they have the ability to change and to implant what's in here. And instead of the laws of God, it's the law like written in the first and in the, in the uh, satanic bible 
Anton LaVey, 1969. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That's the technology putting that idea into people's brains. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. This is God as in the days of Noah. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Think about it now. Think about our brain. Here's all the paintings going on, and here's all the guys with the paperwork. Okay, And mankind had gotten to such a point, such a state, and I think he had help. I think mankind had help with this. Number one, we know the tempter had already tempted and deceived Eve, and those spirits were at work. But we also know the corruption that was taking place by way of the sons of God mating or marrying the daughters of men. We already know that there was corruption going on. So much so now that in man's brain, in his mind, there's no law. There's no, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not. There's nothing like that. Every thought and every imagination was only evil continually. I get back to this movie, uh, Brainstorm. This guy, you know, he did this thing with this girl, recorded it, and then he just kept looping it over and over in his brain. Over and over and over and over. And I'll tell you this, you probably know some people that would love that kind of technology over and over and over and over. You see, people are going to give themselves over. They're not going to be taken by force. They're going to be given exactly what they want. Think about the incentive. The children of Israel going to Canaan land. What's the incentive to serve all these false gods? The incentive was is that these false gods had a goddess and she was to be worshipped a certain way. She was a fertility goddess. And so the Israelites go in there and they see that and they go, that's the religion I want right there. You see how it works? This technology is going to be embraced by people. And it's just going to corrupt their mind. And when it gets too far, God's going to say, we're going to flood again. Not with water but with iniquity in the last days. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people. Even Listen to this now. Oh, here we go. Even the fruit of their thoughts. Stop right here. The fruit of their thoughts. Well, let me finish reading the verse here. Because they have not hearkened unto my words, and nor to my law, but rejected it. The guys over here have the words and the law, and they're reading. They're the lawyers who are saying, uh, you can't do that. Uh, that's going to get us into a lot of trouble here. Uh, there's consequences for this. Dire consequences if we do this. These are the lawyers over here. Okay, Telling us the law. Reading the law. Saying the law says you can't do that. Okay, This says, you know what? I want to do whatever I want to. I want to be free. Okay, That's what they do. And God says, fine, that's what you're going to do. Here's, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get the fruit of your thoughts. Genesis chapter 3. Lucifer, the serpent, beguiling Eve, putting these ideas in her mind. And all she can think about now is that fruit, that fruit, that fruit. I want that fruit. I want. And so what happens? She gets exactly what she thought to do. And I'm telling you that we're headed as a civilization, as a society, as a world, we're headed to getting the fruits of our thoughts. Those thoughts may be helped along a little bit. We, we dealt with this idea of subliminal advertising here a few months ago. That process is already taking place. People are being programmed and trained and conditioned to think in a very specified way in order to bring about the fruit of of the thoughts of mankind. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. Here's some of those fruits. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed, number one, evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. 
Number two, adulteries. Three, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye. Think about the back of the one dollar bill. Blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Okay? You've heard of this idea of what goes in comes must come out. And I can tell you that when you start putting all these bad... I, I'm going to sound like Joel Osteen for a minute, okay? So you just forgive me. It is true that the more we defile our mind, the more that is going to come out. Music has an effect upon our actions. The things that we watch and see have an effect upon our actions. We cannot deny that. This is why the Bible tells us to renew our mind, to think on these things. Philippians chapter 4 tells us whatsoever things are true. So you know what? Get some Bible in your brain. Get some word of God back into the places of your mind that it belongs in. And God will protect you from these days that are coming. Luke chapter 11 verse 17. Jesus, the Bible says, but he knowing their thoughts said unto them. Listen, I like this. He knowing the thought, the Bible knows the thoughts of men. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and the house divided against the house falleth. Now, I want you to think about, I love this. I love this because I used to think that everybody on the devil's team all had to play along the same way. I, I used to think that. It used to boggle me about who, you know, you hear the Bilderbergers and the Vatican and the Masons and the Muslims and, the, you know, all of these different groups, it seems like they're like not all working together. And I'm going, come on, guys, if you get it together, they're, they're not going to. They're a house divided. This is how we know that their kingdom is going to fall. Now, I want you to stop and think about this, okay? I love this. I love this. Re, uh, J- Daniel chapter 2. Okay, you go back to Daniel chapter 2. Here's what you find. You find an image, and it's standing upon its feet. And what's and, and I don't know, we don't think about this a whole lot, but I want to tell you what. My dad, before he died, was a diabetic, and he lost several toes because of uh, just sickness that he had, and it made him wobble when he walked. He couldn't stand up very well. You know why? The toes are the, about the strongest part of the body because when we stand up, the toes just keep us balanced. Okay? We don't know it, but when we stand, we lean. We t- our body tends to sway because gravity pulls on us, and it's our toes that keep us standing up. They, they're constantly shifting and balancing. Constantly. Okay? In the kingdom, in Daniel chapter 2, in that fourth kingdom, you see, there's a problem. They mingled themselves with the seed of men, but here's what happened. The kingdom was partly strong, and partly weak. It was part iron, but it was part clay. And all that had to happen was, see, that kingdom already is divided. Jesus, see, he knew their thoughts. That kingdom was already divided. And so the stone cut without hands doesn't attack the head. It doesn't go after the chest. It's not going after the legs. It's going after what the Bible calls the strength of sin, which is the law. There's ten commandments and ten toes. The stone hits those toes. They crumble. What happens to the image? That verse, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against a house falleth. I love the Bible. I absolutely love it. Now, let me, let me explain to you this, the spiritual part of this, the spiritual side of these thoughts, these ideas, and dreams. We're going to talk about dreams here in a minute too. Job chapter 4 verse 12. Listen to this. Now a thing was secretly brought to me and mine ear received a little thereof. In the thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me and trembling which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit, look at that, a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. You know what the book of Job is making us aware of? That dreams and thoughts at times are spiritually motivated, spiritually seated, spiritually conceived by a spirit. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy 
mind. Why? Because spirits want to control your mind. The article that we read at the beginning of this broadcast talked about the ability. The ability to to implant thoughts back into people's heads. The technology came from, here's the article here we're going to look at, the technology came from the ability to read the thoughts to begin with, map them out, and to show what they were. So this article here, Brain Scanner, can record your dreams on video. Just a few weeks ago, we posted about how brain patterns can reveal almost exactly what you're thinking. Now researchers at UC Berkeley have figured out how to extract what you're picturing inside your head, and they can play it back on video. And so here's, here's the technology now. Now we're going to we're gonna get into the dream idea. Okay? Uh, what are dreams? What are dreams? We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but, uh, and, and we'll get into the spiritual idea. But I want you to think about this thing for a minute. That in the psychology idea behind dreams is that uh, your brain goes into very, 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 very deep uh, sleep. And um, some psychologists, and I kind of like this idea, God developed inside of our brain a way for us to carry out the garbage every day. Uh, we just kind of run through scenarios in our mind, fears that we might have or whatever, things that we've just kind of held back on, and the brain is going and saying, yeah, we need to throw this stuff out. Okay, and that's, that, that may be it. But the idea is, can dreams be, uh, be inspired either by spirits or by technology? And the answer absolutely is yes. Now that we have the technology now to learn how to read the dreams, now we have the technology to be able to go in and control the dreams. I mentioned the movie back in the 1980s called uh, Brainstorm. There was another one came out not too long after that um, called Dreamscape. And it was about th- this... G- government military project of getting inside people's dreams and making things happen. We talked about this when we talked about how the brain works. A movie called Inception. These people were masters at going, listen to this, going inside down four layers into a person's dream and implanting the seed of a thought so that that seed of a thought would spring up and become the fruit of what it is that they desire. You see, there's like they're reading the Bible and writing movie scripts because this Bible is right. The fruit of people's thoughts is going to come to pass one of these days. And that's what the movie Inception is all about. The word Inception is related to the word Conception. And we use the word Conception both in the... In the physical realm of a man and a woman conceiving a child and with the idea of us conceiving a thought inside of our mind. And now we have the technology to be able to control the outcome of what people think. We're bringing, we are bringing about in this world the ability to produce the dreams and the thoughts that will bring in the new world order, that will bring in the kingdom of the Antichrist, that will give people the fruit of their thoughts. God says, okay, I know what you're thinking because I can know your thoughts and I'm going to give you exactly what you wanted. Those who love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind will be protected from this. Those who love the Bible and want the guys in the cubicles to keep reading out the law and the standards and the guidelines for which we're to follow. That's the people that God is going to protect. He's going to put his laws inside their minds and they won't go astray from them. Okay? But it's the people who say, the Bible... We need to get, we, we're going we're gonna to fire the guys in the cubicles. We're going to turn the lights out. We're going to lock up all the file drawers. And we're just going to do whatever the Spirit flows us to do. I've been listening to a lot of stuff and I hear a lot about flow. Flow, the, this freedom of flow, the Spirit flowing. You see, we get the idea of flowing like this. It's waves and it's, okay? I want you to think about that. Because God had a lot to say about dreams. Now, let me, let me help you with something. Because I've had people say, uh, I, I believe in prophetic dreams. Okay, 
Um, okay, let me let me read some scriptures here. Okay, because you guys, you ought to know me. I believe the Bible. I believe it's right all the time. And um, the Bible, ta- you know, everybody says, ah, the book of Joel, you're going to have dreams and visions. And so now everybody's having dreams and visions. There are some, there are some pastors, some pastors I know, and whole movements that won't do anything in, until they have a dream. And when they have a dream, they'll do exactly what they think the dream is being interpreted to tell them what to do. They'll do exactly what they think that's supposed to do. Let me let me let me see if something makes sense because I you know I have my testimony, but I like to just stick with scripture. My testimony is when God called me into this ministry of studying Bible prophecy, I was listening to these guys that are having dreams and visions all the time, and I said, God, I want dreams and visions. I, I want to have a dream where I see everything that's going to happen, then I'll tell everybody what's going on. God's so good to me. God's so good to me. Every time, and I can remember at least two times, maybe three, when I asked God to give me dreams and visions. And every time, God said, Mike, here they are right here. I'll give them to you. And after a while, I just quit asking God because I accepted the answer that I had. You see, I've dreamed some dreams, and some have been pretty wacky. Okay. I've dreamed some dreams that I felt like maybe were prophetic. They never came to pass. Okay, And so, I, you know, th- there may be some that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe. I don't know. I just know that I don't trust what goes on in my mind. I don't trust that. But I can trust this. Joel chapter 2. God did promise dreams and visions. Listen to what he said. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. I want to tell you what I what I kind of think here. Okay? This is Matthew and this is Joel. This is referred to as the Old Testament. This is referred to as the New Testament. Testament, the old and the young, the old men dreaming dreams, and the young men seeing visions. How does the Bible end up, by the way, in the book of Revelation? Well, we have the first three chapters, which are letters written to the churches, but after that, all of those chapters are what? They're visions. And you see, I trust those visions, and so I believe in them. Through the pages of the Word of God. Here's the problem. Because even if you're convinced that God is still giving prophetic dreams today, let me tell you how bad this turns out. And let me tell you why you can't trust them. Let's say somebody in your church, that all God's, God, they're a prophet. They have like dreams and visions all the time. Okay? Number one, how do you know? You see, because I could probably think about it for a while, I could probably come up with something. To look spiritual, and I could probably influence a lot of people. Say, "Oh, listen, God gave me a prophetic vision. Let me tell you what God said was going to happen." I see. I could do. I could make the whole thing up, and I could deceive a lot of people, and I could probably get a lot of money out of it because that's what some people do. So, how do you know they they didn't just make it up? And how do you know that they got it from God? Because now we're seeing. Now we're seeing the technology. If you don't believe spirits have anything to do with dreams, and Job said they did, now we have the technology. To make dreams, we have the ability. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not not known, and let us serve them. You see, God said, God warned in Deuteronomy 13. He said, Dreamers of dreams, you watch these guys. Because they're going to come up with all these dreams and these prophecies. They are going to lead you to worship another God. They will. Or other gods. Other gods. They will do it. And if you have the mindset that you're relying upon all these dreamers of dreams and these latter-day prophets to tell you what God said, rather than trusting the scriptures, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 25. I have heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, listen to this, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. 
Did you hear that? They prophesying lies and they said, oh, I dreamed, I dreamed a dream. God said, how long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause, think of the words that are being used here, my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Are you, uh, come on people, how much clearer can the, does the Bible have to be? The latter-day prophets and the dreamers of dreams, God says they're lying through their teeth. And they'll make you forget even the name of Jesus himself. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams. Listen, look at this now. Which ye caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name, and I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Did you get that? Neither hearken to your dreams, which ye caused to be dreamed. Now, let me, uh, let me make a little confession here. Talking about dreams, okay? Uh, I wasn't sleepy one night and I had the television on. I was watching a movie about a guy that was a uh, military sniper. Okay, And I watched it for a few minutes and I turned it off and I went to sleep. I woke up at 3 o'clock the next morning because I had a dream. I had a dream that I had a sniper rifle and I was at a gas station not too far from my home and I picked off and killed seven people. And when I did that, I laid the gun down and I stood there and I, I surrendered to the police and I'm going, man, I'm going to prison for a long time for this. And I woke up and I'm going, oh, I can't believe I dreamed that. Then I remembered what I had watched and I went, oh, I, I guess I can believe that I dreamed that. You see, we can create our own little fantasy dreams. God said... Neither hearken to your dreams which ye caused to be dreamed. You're just dreaming what you wanted to dream. Okay? I want you to think about that. Um, we, did, we dealt with this here a while back. Sid Roth. I don't like his program. I don't like the information that he puts out. And I don't think you ought to listen to him. He puts out some stuff. Um, I, I'm not going to play clips of this. It's just too much detail to get into in this thing. But there was an episode of It's Supernatural. You can find it on the internet. Here he has Mark Verkler again. Now, you've got to remember, Mark Verkler is the guy that came on Sid Roth's program about a year ago and uh, was teaching everybody how to hear the voice of God. And it's not from the Bible. Oh, no, that, you, know, it's, you, don't need a, you don't need a Bible. You just need to go into contemplative prayer, go into a trance, meditative state, uh, close your brain down, send the guys with the, with the folders saying, uh, no, we're not supposed to do this, and uh, we need to keep the lights on here. Uh, close all those guys down, tell them to go home. And then when all that happens, then you're going to hear a voice on the inside of you. And then, oh, no, by the, trust me, it's God. And uh, when, it, when you hear the voice and you wake up, write everything down, that'll be in your new Bible. That's what Mark Verkler was putting out there, how to hear the voice of God had nothing to do with hearing it from the Bible. Now Verkler's back, okay? And uh, the, the, here's the guarantee, the guarantee that Verkler made on there. Now he's talking about dreams and visions. And uh, he learned this from a guy named Herman Riffle, uh, the, who he heard speak. And I couldn't find a whole lot of information about this guy, but apparently he went around doing seminars on how to interpret prophetic dreams. And Mark Verkler gets on there and he says this. He says, I will guarantee that you will have dreams every single week of your life and you can receive divine counsel from God through those dreams. And so Sid Roth is going, oh, man, I want to do this. How can I do this? And so Verkler says, here's, here's, it starts out with a mantra. Here's what you got to do. Here's what, here's what starts the whole process out. Okay, You sit down on the edge of your bed and you declare out loud with your voice, I believe God will speak to me tonight. And then you put a piece of paper and pencil by your desk. And that is a, he talks about this. He said, that's a notification to your mind and your heart that you're ready to receive these Dreams. You see, you're causing them to be dreamed is what you're doing. And he's promoting this. He even talks about, he even talks about uh, a woman. He gives the testimony of a woman. Listen to this now. You're like this. 
who's a script writer for Hollywood, actually wrote a script for a movie that you know was distributed out there. And Sid Roth's going, oh, I saw that movie. That was a good movie. He talks about this woman who is a script writer who started dreaming this way once a week and God was giving her things. Is it hard for us to conceive in our mind that the people who are writing scripts for TV shows, movies, news programs, and commercials, and books and magazines, the people who are writing this stuff, is it hard for us to imagine that they're getting help? There's an agenda out there, people. There's an agenda. Um, got a couple more things here. I, you know what? I'm going to wait. I want to stop right here. Okay? I'm going to. I'm going to put this uh, somewhere else. Um, maybe next week. I don't know. But I, I want to stop right here because I, I want. I want you to. I want you to ponder this idea about your thoughts. God knoweth the thoughts of man that they're vanity. Okay? I never impressed God with anything that I thought. I never, God, never, God does not sit up in heaven and wait for the next Watchman broadcast to come out to go, Ooh, Mike, that was good. Man, I know it's my word, but I didn't know that was in there. God doesn't do that. Okay? And I can tell you that God's never been impressed with any of my thoughts. I, however, have been impressed with the thoughts of God because I know that the thoughts of God are for me and intended to me, and the thoughts of God to me are good. And I have to be careful in my life what I allow to influence my brain, my thoughts. I'm sometimes careful about what I read, what I watch, what I listen to, who I, who I, who I uh, hang around. Because be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. We live in a world right now where the technology exists. To control, you're talking about the ultimate in psychological operations, psych, psyops, warfare. We live in that day right now. The Christian, those who want to escape the things that are coming, those people who want the help from God can get the help from God. And God will protect you. God will build a hedge around your brain and around your mind that the devil cannot get through unless you let him. Okay? Unless you open the door and let him in, he can't get in there. It's called sobriety, soberness. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And he's going for your brain, people, your mind, your thoughts, your conscience. Have you ever done anything wrong? Have you done anything wrong this week? I have. You know what my best friend is? My best friend is my conscience. Sometimes my conscience won't let me sleep at night. Sometimes my conscience will just bother me because it's my knowledge of what I've done. The guys in the cubicles are going, uh, yeah, we have this uh, recorded here. And uh, boy, I tell you what, we need to deal with this right now. The lawyers are telling me, Mike, we need to deal with this. And then I'm getting on my face before God and say, God, I am. I'm sorry. God, I need, I need a clean conscience, a pure conscience, undefiled. I don't want to be like the false prophets of the last days that can just sin arbitrarily and think nothing of it. That's dangerous. They're twice dead, and I don't want to be that way. And I don't want you to be that way. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. We will see you the next time on the next Watchman video broadcast. Bye-bye.